looks like it's working. And I'll just hand it over to you and give you a thunderclap. Here we go. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, uh, yeah, that was a great introduction. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you for Cloud Rejects for, for having given me this opportunity to talk to you about Prometheus. Um, so I will just jump right in um, and we will go through, oops, let me get this off the screen. <clears throat> there we go. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, right. We'll just jump right in and talk about Prometheus uh, production grade monitoring with Prometheus Federation. That's really going to be the focus here. Uh, we've got 30 minutes here and um, using Prometheus in production is a pretty advanced topic. We could probably talk for a few hours about it. Uh, so I really wanted to concentrate on one of the pieces where I work with the community a lot, which is uh, integrating Prometheus, uh, we're using Prometheus Federation to coal or aggregate all these metrics that come from uh, different smaller Prometheus instances into one larger Prometheus instance. So uh, let's see, we'll keep moving here. This is me. Uh, I, I, you did a great job on the introduction. I don't think there's much more to say other than if you have questions or you want to learn about what I'm making in the kitchen. That's what I'm doing now that we're on, on quarantine these days. So uh, yeah, come visit me in Slack, Linkerd Slack, and uh, I'll, I'll, we'll chat with you about anything really. In this presentation, we'll talk about a quick Prometheus overview. This is meant to be a, a little bit more than a beginner. So again, we'll just refresh on some topics. Then we'll talk about deploying Prometheus and what that looks like. And then we'll dive into Federation and I'll show you a, an instance that's connected to a couple of clusters, which is which was really fun to set up. So let's dive right in. Prometheus overview, you know, the basics are that it's a systems and service monitoring system. It is designed for collecting high cardinality, multi-dimensional data. Uh, it's meant for scalability, meaning be, well, not meaning, but because we have so many samples of data, so much information that's coming in, uh, to store these this, these pieces of data into a normal database would make it impossible to query because you'd have so many writes and so many reads, and it uh, it would just slow things down. So the folks at SoundCloud took this and it, took this idea and decided, well, instead let's make something that's going to work for us. And they created sound, or sorry, they created Prometheus, and uh, the rest, I guess, is kind of history. Uh, it's a graduated CNCF project. Uh, Linkerd is also part of the CNCF, and we'll see how uh, I integrate Linkerd with Prometheus specifically. Uh, and at the end of the day, a lot of the conversations that I have with folks are around the fact that. We have a lot of tools in our observ observability and monitoring toolkit. And in this case, Prometheus is, uh, I think it's an important and powerful tool. And as I mentioned in the description of this talk, it really is becoming uh, pretty ubiquitous. Almost everybody is using Prometheus. And even in the last presentation, we had somebody asking if uh, Andrea, I hope I got that right, supports uh, Prometheus metrics. So um, yeah, it's it's everywhere and it's very, very useful, very helpful. So that's the basics. When we talk about deploying Prometheus, we're talking about, uh, again, a, more of a production grade type of deployment. Um, when I first started using Prometheus, I was, kicking the tires on it and I created an instance and ran the binary and had a very simple configuration. And in fact, I'm using that today for this, this presentation. So the, there are a lot of things to take into consideration. And in order to do that, we should understand the Prometheus architecture. As we can see here, there's the main Prometheus server and they've done a really good job of giving you different ways to, to, to deploy Prometheus. Uh, we, I have seen it most often run in a, as a binary on a separate server 
because people often treat it just like a database. And I, I think I come from the days of monolithic applications and um, building J2EE sites where we're running against uh, an R, or something like Oracle or MySQL. So I see a lot of, of people treating Prometheus in the same way that you might treat a database server. The good news is you don't have to do that. You can very easily run it in Kubernetes. Uh, the point that I was making there is that the team has done a really good job, the community I should say, has done a really good job of making it so that you can deploy Prometheus anywhere in multiple ways. Um, again, we're gonna run it in a binary today on a virtual machine and uh, take a look at, see, see what that looks like. Things to consider while you're deploying Prometheus, uh, especially for production. Storage for me is, is one of the main ones. Um, and that, I, I made the assumption here that that includes in-memory storage as well. Uh, it's important to call out that when I'm talking about storage here, I'm talking about in-memory and physical storage. Uh, Prometheus has several integrations with a number of different storage providers, specifically time series storage pro providers like InfluxDB. I'm gonna miss so many names here. And I, this is a, a scenario where um, I think there are enough that you can, when you're deploying Prometheus, you can pick the one that makes sense for you, the one that your company is using. Um, and I haven't tried them all, so I can't make like a recommendation about which one I think is best for integrating with Prometheus. So. Um, the, uh, the docs have a really good amount of information about uh, where the storage types, um, but one thing to take into consideration for specifically for physical storage is that um, the, the docs themselves mentioned that when we're sampling this time series data, we can expect one to two bytes per sample. And so uh, I did a little bit of, of napkin math here. And so the algorithm that they provide is that you have uh, the num the amount of storage that you need is the number of seconds of retention times the number of samples per, uh, per, per uh, sorry per minute, number of samples per minute. So in one of my test environments, I looked up the number of samples that I was, <clears throat> excuse me, that I was getting per or per minute, and I was scraping every minute. So it was 1,200 samples, which means that uh, I was getting 200 per second. So when I put all this math together, that ends up for storing 15 days of data it ends up being 259 megabytes at one byte. So if we increase that to two bytes, clearly it doubles and we're at, about, we're at about half a gig. So I bring this up because that was one of the first conversations that I had with, uh, with a, a user in the community who was collecting a ton of, of metrics. And so when we think about distributed systems and all the different sources that we can start collecting metrics from, from it's really easy to point Prometheus and say, go scrape this target, grab me this data and just collect it. And it, the easy part to do there is, especially if we're using um, cloud native technologies, which are scaling. And so uh, you all of a sudden have uh, a bunch of replicas or instances of a service that you're scraping from. Prometheus is going to say, okay, you told me to go scrape this. I'm gonna scrape it. And all of a sudden you've got this, uh, this massive, collection of data that could be slowing down your 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 application or sorry wouldn't be your application it would be your prometheus instance and your ability to collect that those metrics and that data so um and anecdotally the the note that i have is that there was one user that had allocated i believe a terabyte of memory to their prometheus instance because of out of all the systems that they were scraping metrics from they had to, in order for Prometheus to be usable, they had to have this much memory. Uh, it's my understanding that that has that was an older version of Prometheus, and since 2.13, memory consumption and usage has gotten much better. So, um, again, that's anecdotal. Uh, 
just the fact that we have something that can manage that much data and query over it is really, really impressive. So again, considering storage, we have memory and we have um, actual physical storage. And there are storage providers that Prometheus integrates with. Security is uh, the next thing to consider. In short, Prometheus is wide open. Uh, the, and what I mean by that is the endpoints are wide open. So you'll want to, when you deploy Prometheus, make sure that if you've got dashboards or endpoints, that those are internal. They're not accessible from the outside world. If you do have to access them from the outside world, make sure it's through a VPN or a VPC or something like that. Um, and again, in a distributed systems architecture, it's very likely you may have to do that, but um, it just be aware that uh, you may have an open endpoint if you're using Prometheus. Uh, another aspect is using the push gateway. There are situations where it's possible to have uh, a lot of information that you're collecting. So Prometheus, uh, let's take a step back. Prometheus has a push model or a pull model. So when it does these scrapes, it's making an HTTP request out to some endpoint. And that endpoint is providing these metrics and Prometheus pulls them in, scrapes them and stores it, stores them in its, uh, in its data store. There are some instances where you might want to have a push uh, where you have a, and this is a, a a specific component for Prometheus where you would, when uh, metrics need to be sent to the server rather to Prometheus rather than Prometheus pulling them, you have this component that says, okay, here you go, here's some metrics, and um, that is the push gateway. We saw that in the architecture uh, diagram. The main reason you would want to use this is for something that is uh, like an, a job that occurs every once in a while, like a, a cron job or even a job in Kubernetes, a, a job resource, I should say. So there are limited use cases for it, but you should know that it's available to you in the event that you're in that scenario. And finally, there's configuring alerts. The alert manager is a huge part of Prometheus. Um, it's Again, at the top of this presentation, it, I mentioned that it's a, a system for monitoring and alerting about services and other systems. So there are things to take into consideration when you're configuring alerts. Um, some people will tell you that, uh, well, the, the short version is you want to make sure that your alerts aren't too aggressive, but they're also not uh, giving you enough information. So the there are the people who don't want to be woken up at three in the morning, especially if there's a, a very simple, especially if it's not a not a real issue, meaning that the the measure for setting sending the alert is too low. An example of that would be uh, if we so Prometheus uses labels and values of those labels. So if you have a service and its success rate drops below fifty percent that's probably way too late to actually send an alert. But if the success rate is something around like 99% in it or 98%, whatever your threshold is, and that's gonna be unique to your application and unique to your service. So again, configuring alerts is a little bit of a, uh, I don't know, it could be called a dark art, I guess, but um, it takes some time, takes some tuning, be patient with it as you're deploying your Prometheus instances. Okay, so uh, just a quick intro on the scrape process here and what I'm gonna show you in, uh, in the server that I've got set up. Prometheus uh, is, in my server was, was configured to scrape every 60 seconds. I've changed that to scrape every 15 seconds because I wasn't getting great data. In this environment, uh, we see that the source for the Prometheus metrics is the Linkerd proxy. And that's built in, that's by design built into the, the Linkerd proxy, which is part of the service mesh that uh, when, because it's handling all this network traffic, it is a great source of truth for things like uh, 
P99 latency, success rates, error rates, uh, all of the, the golden metrics that you may have heard of. So in this case, we've got Linkerd handling the proxy itself, sending these, these metrics over to an instance of Prometheus. And this is just a sample diagram. Um, I wouldn't go and try and build out an application like this because uh, there are better architectures out there. Uh, just for the sake of explaining, we could very easily not have the services being part of the service mesh, but they would have to provide an endpoint for those Prometheus metrics. So as you're considering, you're developing, you say, okay, we're definitely gonna use Prometheus. We want our services to emit these Prometheus metrics. There are a number of libraries that you can find for uh, languages uh, that will allow you to instrument your services with Linkerd, or sorry, with uh, Prometheus metrics if you choose to do so. Personally, I like fewer lines of code so that I don't have to add in these endpoints to my services, which is why it's nice to have something like a service mesh, which just gives you this information uh, when you install it. So yeah, if you're using Go, Java, Node, uh, Python, I mean, any of the, the popular languages, you can instrument your services very easily with Promethe to emit Prometheus metrics. Okay. Now we jump into the fun part, which is the federation. So what federation means is it, we have, again, that large, think of that large one terabyte Prometheus that I told you about that is, uh, that's running somewhere. It has a long-term data store. It's the one that's responsible for sending alerts. And you can have a smaller instance of Prometheus, which itself is a scrape target. So if we go back to, or if we think about that last diagram, we have our Linkerd proxies, which are scrape targets. And now we have another instance of Prometheus, which is a scrape target. So it's pretty interesting. I mean, this is a really nice setup. They, they were, this architecture I think is really great. They did a, a nice job of setting this up in such a way that you could do something really crazy, like have multiple Prometheus instances scraping or federating data to this primary Prometheus. And it doesn't have to, these could, these question marks mean this just could be anything that is emitting Prometheus metrics. So now you can see the aggregation that's happening here because you've got a couple of small instances of Prometheus, Prometheus, Prometheus? that was going to happen at some point during this, a couple of small Prometheus instances and uh, they are feeding data over to the scrape targets. So, um, I think that should be all clear. Before we do q and I just want to jump into a quick terminal because if we don't do that, I don't feel like it's a proper demo or a proper presentation. So um, I'm already logged into my Prometheus instance here. This is, a, like I said, it's a virtual v VM, virtual VM, it's a VM. Um, and I have, uh, I'm just running the Prometheus uh, binary directly. So uh, I have a very simple configuration file that I want to show you. Oops. Okay, so the are there are some this is a very simple, very simple Prometheus configuration file. We've got some global configurations that say scrape targets every 15 seconds. I have nothing in the alert uh, manager configuration right now. Uh, but what I wanna show you is this part down here. And this is where my federation is coming into play. So I have, when you install Linkerd, it deploys a, again, one of these small instances, in memory only instance of Prometheus and it stores data for six hours, which is way shorter than uh, you would want to really understand what your application is doing. And it's meant to be, the metrics are meant to be exported to a, an instance like the one that we're looking at here. So uh, I've configured this one to have a scrape interval of 15 seconds, which is the same as the global configuration. The reason that I had this here is because I had it set to a longer duration before. So you can set this to however, whatever you think is important for your application. 
And then we can see that the queries, uh, the query that it generates, and Prometheus has its own query languages. I should have mentioned this at the beginning. It's called PromQL, and it uh, we'll take a look at some of the syntax. I've got about 10 minutes left, so I'll, I'll probably spend, you know, I'll rush, not rush through this, I'll get through this as quickly as I can and still have time for questions. And what we can see here is that I have these uh, static config targets, which are two Kubernetes clusters running Linkerd, where I've exposed the Linkerd, um, Linkerd Prometheus instance. So uh, I hope that nobody right now is spamming or hacking my my IP addresses here, but we'll see. There, have fun. We're going to shut these down after the the demo. So that is the basics of the Prometheus configuration. Um, again, this is not production grade. This would take a little bit more deployment or a little more. Um, work for a production deployment. Another interesting thing is that Prometheus is actually is configured to scrape itself for metrics. So um, we'll see we'll see that in the output as well. Uh, I'm a little afraid to show you this because the last time I looked at it were, there were some errors in there, but this is the log file from Prometheus. We see that there are some out of order sample errors, some 404s or uh, yeah, some bad things are happening. I need to sort this out on my own, uh, but uh, I noticed that as I was preparing for this. Okay, now let's take a look at, um, I get to set my cube config up here. Uh, give me, bear with me for just one second. Um, and while I'm doing that, please feel free to answer your, or ask your questions. I'm eager to hear what you all are interested to learn. Okay, great. Yeah, we do have one question from Renee. Is there a way to compact Prometheus time series in order to preserve some long-term trends? There definitely is. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up because it reminded me that another important thing about storage is to uh, make sure that you are, um, you are back backing up your actual storage. Um, I, off the top of my head, don't know the actual command for compacting that data, but there, there certainly is. Okay, well, that was the only question we had so far. Okay, great. Um, almost got this sorted. Okay. Make sure this worked. Yes, perfect. Okay, so let's use this context. Okay, so uh, what I want to show you is that um, let's do in our Linkerd namespace, this is where uh, a Kubernetes cluster running on GKE where I have Linkerd installed. And we can see in the deployments, the and the Linkerd namespace is where the Linkerd control plane is. If you have questions about the Linkerd control plane, definitely find me on Slack and I can talk to you all about that. I have, I have a whole slide deck of it, it's great. Um, but specifically we see that we have a, this instance of Prometheus and this is actually just Prometheus running in a container. Um, so if I do look at the logs, I should see, oops, there we go. Um, basic, this is the same stuff that we saw in the other log, except I had debug level turned up in, or logs turned up to debug in, that, in the other terminal. So um, this is to show you that the Prometheus running in this other VM is scraping from, let's see, scraping from, uh, right, this load balancer here. And so that's what we saw in Linkerd Prometheus in the configuration. This IP address at this port is serving um, Linkerd metrics so that it can jump across the internet, pull those metrics, and, and um, then we can collect them. Now that we have them collected, we can then go and look at them and see, 
uh, what run queries using the UI. Uh, and these are the these are the kinds of things that you would use for uh, building Grafana dashboards, which is something that we do in Linkerd, and uh, also if you need to do, just take a look at what if you think there might be an issue, or just get these get the data and have a, something visual. Grafana or Prometheus comes with a great UI for running queries. So I've got a few of them saved over here, and we'll start with a simple one. Um, we want to look at P95 latencies. And so the what I'm going to show you here is interesting because the Prometheus on the right uh, is the federated one, the, the primary cluster or primary instance. And the Prometheus on the left is the GKE instance. Now again, remember there's another cluster that's giving metrics to this primary cluster. And so it should be aggregating and pulling all those together. So if I did this right, we'll see similar but different metrics in each one. Um, okay, I know why this is happening. I didn't, I didn't change my uh, seconds here. The, there we go. Okay, so here's an interesting one that tells us the P95 for all of the pods that are running in this books app deployment, which is the sample application that we have. So we can see again, they're similar, but there's a little bit of difference, a little bit more variance that's in the, uh, in the federated instance, uh, whereas the, the, uh, let's see if I can drill this down a little bit. Whereas the, oh, I think I drilled it down too much, but the, the instance that's standing alone, the GK instance has slightly different data. Uh, I'll show you one last more before we go, unless there are questions, but uh, there's a really fun one that shows us success rates, and we can see how those are different across two different instances of Prometheus. And, and we do have a question as you're doing that. Not sure if Great. it's already covered, but how does failure recovery work? Uh, so for, you're talking about if the instance of Prometheus itself, I assume that the, the question is about the instance of Prometheus itself. So the primary instance, uh, the one that's over here, that's running on the virtual machine, if that one fails, so the main key there when you're doing the deployment is to make sure that you have the uh, storage, again, it's backed up. Your storage is separate from the actual binary uh, so that if, if this VM crashes, I would lose all my data because I'm not actually writing, writing anything to permanent storage. But if I had one of the storage integrations set up, then I would configure this instance to write to that store so that if this instance crashed, that would be, uh, it would still recover. We could start up a new instance. If it was running within Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes would uh, reschedule a new pod so that, you know, we, there would be some gap in there for sure, but um, hopefully it wouldn't be too long or too great. So yeah, that's a good question. It, and that was the original title for this was watching the watcher. So the idea behind that is what happens when Prometheus crashes or Prometheus grows down. And, uh, you know, the, the, the vintage uh, systems engineer, sysadmin in me says, I don't know, let's, let's install something like Nagios. But uh, maybe you have another instance of Prometheus that is monitoring this. Um, I, there are a number of different mechanisms and people probably set this up and worked with Prometheus longer than I have who would have a better answer to that. But make sure that the data is stored uh, and written to a store and is replicated so that if this needs to be reorchestrated or if this the actual instance of Prometheus goes down, it can just go and pull that data again. Now, if that data is lost, well, that's why you do replication. But um, yeah, there's there's definitely uh, a desire to reduce single points of failure, as with most things. So uh, that looks like I'm at time. If there are no more questions, I will sign off. 
and no more questions right now. Great. Well, so thank much. you. Again. Oh, yeah. Thank you for this. This was great. I really enjoyed it.